Irish name. They tried to make it sound German. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody. Let's uh, let's get underway. Thanks a lot for joining us. I know it's tough uh, with exams and so on, so we really appreciate you uh, supporting the event this evening. And uh, it's going to be a really good one because we have Nancy Mann from uh, Estee Lauder Companies with us. As you know, she's a senior VP uh, overseeing all of uh, sustainability and ESG and so forth. And um, we're very pleased also to uh, have with us uh, David Kelly and Daniel Hicks in the front here, who uh, are really uh, the architects of our sustainable business uh, programs and initiatives here at Miami Herbert. So I'm going to sit down now and uh, we'll get straight into a conversation with uh, Nancy and uh, have pl plenty of time for uh, questions a little bit later on. Um, so for, first of all, Nancy, what, what, what is sustainability at Estee Lauder? How does it manifest itself? Well, it's, a, it's a, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and I appreciate, I have a 21 year old who's also in the midst of his exam. So thanks, uh, particularly to the students who made time. Um, uh, one of the, I'd say complexities of our field is this evolving nomenclature, right? So we've gone from corporate social responsibility uh, to sustainability and social impact to um, ESG. I mean, essentially, generally people talk about sustainability and they talk about environmental. So that's essentially what that is. And we include in citizenship, uh, social impact. Okay. We don't say, um, governance in part because, uh, you know, as folks probably know, uh, legal to a great extent and the board of directors own governance. So we do governance with a little G in that we oversee all of our reporting um, and all of our data management mm -hmm. and we recommend policy changes uh, to the group. But, you know, as in most companies, ESG really is a team sport and it's very highly matrixed. Uh, so we're, we're very much, uh, we link arms with other departments as well. How many people do you have uh, on your team and how how do they work? How are they organized? Uh, what roles do they play in the organization as a whole? Well, we currently have 65 people and uh, we have uh, a team of what we call ESG, which are five folks who specialize in reporting. Uh, okay. data reporting, maximizing our scores, understanding, actually folks may know, Climate Disclosure Project just released their newest numbers. So they um, work with our subject matter experts, translate the practice into um, basically language that the readers will understand. Uh, and they also work, uh, we work very heavily with IR, industri uh, investor relations. I spend about a third of my time with investors. So we have about five folks who do ESG, we have a climate team of five people who okay. do all of our scope one, scope two, and scope three work. And uh, we have four regional leads. So every region in the country, a company in the world, sorry, has a lead, uh, basically sort of a mini CSO. And then we have about uh, 12 to 15 people on social impact. We have a company foundation and we have what we call branded funds. So for instance, uh, we have 30 brands and each brand has a cause. So La Mer has a La Mer Ocean Fund. So we have people basically who specialize in creating that giving and working with marketing teams. And then uh, the rest of the team is around product. We spend a lot of time thinking about how to increase the positive environmental and social impact of our products and integrating it into the product life cycle. So for example, 30% of our products are new. So we have a product called uh, a process called new product launch and this team created sustainability stage gates in when you create a new product, because about 80% of the environmental and social impact of a product is determined in its uh, yeah. in the new product launch process. So basically across the business, uh, I'm trying to think if I've left anything out. That's pretty much what the team is. We also have a, a few people who work with us on human rights and fair wage labor and supply chain, but it's kind of soup to nuts. So got, it's an interesting it. gig. Now, how, how did you yourself uh, as a lawyer become the leader of this uh, effort within Estee Lauder? Well, my career, um, I always say follow the boss uh, and, and the, the company. Uh, don't follow necessarily a particular career path. But um, I've spent my career in government, nonprofits, and also for profits. I came to Lauder 16 years ago to run the Mac Viva Glam campaign. I was saying earlier to the dean that it's basically it was one of the OG cause campaigns. We used to raise about $45 million a year selling lipstick, 
with like Rihanna, Lady Gaga. And then we also launched a program called Back to Mac, which is a loyalty recycling program. So basically I had the brand knowledge. They had brought somebody in when they created this function about nine years ago from another beauty company. Mm -hmm. And culturally she just wasn't a fit. And so I kind of threw my hand up and said, oh, I could figure out the environmental piece also. So we layered that in. And the profile of people like me are either people who've been at the company for a long time in one of the subject areas and are know how to get stuff done at that shop. And so right. take on the other load. Or increasingly, there are folks with the ESG degrees. But there, there aren't, you know, we probably only have about, I don't know, seven years of people with ESG degrees. So they're typically not senior enough. Uh, to have a role like mine. But I often say lovingly that I'm a recovering lawyer, which dr drives my father crazy because he was a lawyer. Um, but um, I think it's a very good skill set, actually, in terms of writing, in terms of presentation, um, and in terms of analysis. Okay, so ju just for the benefit of the students here, if you take a look at the 65 or so people in that um, uh, group, uh, are, any, are there any opportunities for people who uh, are graduating either with MBAs or undergraduate degrees in business to apply for these positions, or are they all filled by um, experts with some years of experience? No, well, typically we do look for what my big piece of advice is, get a job, even if you're working for free, in a uh, so you have some executional experience. We have a ton of people with degrees who aren't aware of basically how to get stuff done in an organization. So that's the first thing we look for. We have a very... So just to interject, any internship, any internship then with yeah. any organization as part of your degree program, any experiential yeah, SD, learning actually, would be SD helpful. Actually, Lauder has an internship program. Uh, Mary Lou Marshall, who's my colleague who runs diversity for our company, is on the board here, actually. Um, so, so really look at um, internships to, to get yourself front and center in, in a department, even finance doing ESG. And absolutely, go to el.com. We just actually hired last week a, gra a graduate of Stanford. Um, she had some executional experience. She's going to be on our social impact team. So we are constantly looking for talent, which is one of the reasons I love coming to settings like this, um, because some of our best work really is done, I would say, by our, our newest members. Also, we're very focused on interdisciplinary training. So we have folks who are engineers. We have some folks who have um, master's in science uh, mm -hmm folks from Duke, folks from Adelphi, like we, we're really all about the skill set. And when we hire people, we ask them to create a deck solving a problem that we currently are approaching. And so uh, we've learned a lot. You can have people who've got, you know, whatever degrees and they can't make presentations right. or they come off as arrogant or they, you know, yeah. they can't, you know, they can't explain the technicality. So yeah. I would also really focus on what we call your soft skills which are, do you get along with people? Can you get stuff done? Do you know how to manage up? Do you know how to manage sideways? And that is equally as important, that sort of core general management skill set. Yes. Um, a colleague of mine actually from BlackRock said, you need a major and you need a minor. So I would say your major should always be good management skills mm -hmm. um, and change management. And your minor can be ESG and then something else if you'd like. Okay. You, you mentioned you had, I think, 15 people in social impact. Uh, what What is social impact uh, in Estee Lauder and uh, how do you determine, um, how, how do you measure it and how do you determine what kind of social impact your uh, brand is best associated with? Well, a, a chunk of the team really focuses on sort of corporate purpose. Um, you know, we focus a great deal, for instance, on breast cancer. Uh, but at the end of the day, we make stuff and we sell it. And if we don't make stuff and sell it, our team has no money to give away. So a lot of what the social impact team does is how do we think about cause and brand purpose and how does it show up and corporate reputation, but also how does it show up at retail, whether it be uh, for our breast cancer campaign, we have products. If you buy the product, a certain amount goes to XYZ charity. Right. All of that involves a lot of legality, and it involves, in, involves a lot of, I would say, marketing capability. So that's one piece, brand and corporate purpose. Um, we focused a lot, actually there was a great story, I don't know if you guys read the FT, but there was a story on Melinda Gates and her giving in the FT magazine this weekend. It talked about one of our donor collaboratives. We focus a lot on um, girls' education. If you look at GDP globally, a lot of it, a lot of it is correlated 
to whether girls graduate from high school. So we focused on that and we do a lot of grant collaboratives. So we have a, a group of, of our grant makers that focus on that. Um, we also focus on increasingly how do we, uh, how does our environmental and our social work intersect? So for instance, you know, again, uh, we focus a lot on the communities where we live, work and source. So um, palm oil and Shea are two of our supply chains that involve candidly a lot of poor people in nations that are developing. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've focused on, okay, well, we're gonna you know, make sure that we use suppliers that are complying with the human rights standards and really supporting their workers, but also are there NGOs that we can support in those supply chains? Um, and we support groups in Ghana around financial literacy. Uh, the Palm supply chain has been sadly very well known for abuse against women. So we're working with a, a donor collaborative through Business for Social Responsibility on how do we ensure that there is no domestic uh, not, uh, violence against women in that supply chain. So it's the intersection, I would say. And then the last bucket is human rights. So we just um, uh, refashioned uh, our human rights policy. We're also doing what's called a fair wage labor survey. Mm -hmm. And uh, they work with, actually, we have a UK lead. You probably know this, John. There's a um, UK Modern Slavery Act. Yes. Um, and so not, not well named, honestly, in terms of uh, understanding. But basically, though, we have a team of people that's working with our regional lead in the UK to fill that out, for instance. And also, you know, our, our goal really on this core team is how do we create the best practices that we can deploy to the regions and to the brands. And then how do we use the feedback? So for instance, UK Modern Slavery Act, you may know the bar has really been raised. And so in filling that form out, we then bring that back to the executive leadership team to say, these are the trends, we really need to up our game in X, Y, Z. So I would say overall, that was a very long-winded answer, but for, for consumer goods companies in particular, the S really is showing up as brand purpose because at the end of the day, no one needs to buy lipstick or skincare or fragrance. Um, hopefully they do, and, the, and our products are safe and fabulous. Uh, but we also want to make sure that our, the values of our company and our brands are clearly understandable and present for our consumers. Uh, what about packaging? Oh, packaging. Um, well, you know, packaging, um, it's a, it's a, a very uh, fast-paced area. One of the complexities around packaging is that the recycling industry generally is a money losing industry. And as a result, um, uh, many municipalities, probably also Miami, for instance, pays more money to recycle than they do to dispose of garbage. As a company, what we want to do is make sure that our packages, uh, first of all, are the most efficient as possible. So they're lightweight and they're, we use recyclable materials, but also at the end of the life, the consumer knows to do what to do with them. So we spent a lot of time on consumer education. About 80% of beauty products are disposed of in the bathroom. Most people don't recycle things in the bathroom. So we spent a lot of time focusing on consumer education. And then what we've done is with our markets, created take back programs, which can also be loyalty programs, um, and very clear labeling and increasing of uh, recyclable plastic. Uh, one of the things that's happened is that the, the price of recycled plastic is higher than virgin plastic. And so the other piece that we've done is we're, we're basically trying to leverage our size as a big corporation and partner with our packaging suppliers to create innovative solutions, whether that be paper. Uh, we have a paper tube that we use in our Aveda brand. We've just created recyclable samples for our Aveda brand. So, you know, we're basically a big house. And so I think the other thing that I would always say about ESG is leverage your size. You know, if you're a small indie brand, you have a small supply chain, you know where the stuff is made. Sometimes it's made in your garage. For us, we have a much bigger supply chain, but we can actually enter meaningful partnerships um, and, and leverage size. But there's a, there's a lot of room for innovation and in packaging, some good stuff going on, um, but certainly lots of room to get rid of more plastic, virgin plastic. Uh, given that um, um, you have some very strong European competitors um, and Europe in many respects is ahead of the U.S. in terms of uh, consumer sensitivity to some of these uh, issues. Um, are, do you find yourself playing catch-up, or do you feel that you're able to 
uh, take a global leadership position in this area, even though based in the U.S. where consumer concern is not as well manifested? Yeah, well, um, certainly our European competitors have had the advantage of, of better tax laws, candidly, and practices, and I'd say cultural emphasis. Um, at the same time, you know, ESG, I would say, <clears throat> in terms of leadership, is always kind of a humbling game. So we 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 shoot basically in our strategy. We've we've determined what we're going to be the best at. We want to be the best in climate. And we want to be the best in social impact, uh, inclusion and diversity, and also employee safety. That and green chemistry. That said, we work actually very closely with our competitors. For instance, one of the big pushes, which is an important push, is around ingredient transparency. What's in the product and what does it do? So we've actually been working with our colleagues at L'Oreal and Unilever and Natura, which is a great uh, brand house coming out of Brazil, to focus on how do we create a common standard? Because basically reg multiple regulations across the world load in a lot of cost. And the ultimate goal of really trying to educate our consumer um, is, is where we've been focusing. So I would say relative possibly to other streams of work, CSOs or, or chief sustainability officers probably compete less with our competitors. Also, um, we have really focused on, and we were just at COP27 having a meeting, we really want to learn from other sectors. For instance, food. We were talking about food and beverage before, Indra Nui and, and some of the great work at Coca-Cola we can really learn in beauty from some of that work. So what we try to do is basically um, collaborate as best we can, particularly with food um, and scents. Uh, and also I would say within our industry, you know, one of the things I have to say generally about beauty is I think we've kind of punched above our weight in terms of climate solutions and in terms of a lot of the sustainability practices. I think primarily because we have such educated consumers uh, in our, in our case, primarily women, but, um, you know, I would say, you know, we just got a whole bunch of ratings and rankings out this week. We made, we got an A in water we, from Climate Disclosure Project. We used to have an A minus. We went from an A in climate to a B in large part because we haven't set a net zero uh, target because we feel that the glide path to achieving it is not clear enough. So it's an iterative game and you have to basically keep your focus on execution um, and I would say also within the industry collaboration. Talk, talk to us a little bit about water. Water. Well, first of all, um, you know, obviously Florida is an area where there's a lot of water scarcity. Um, we as a business tend not, we tend to operate primarily in developed countries where there is not water scarcity. The, the um, exception to that would be we have a very big travel retail business in the Caribbean and, and in Asia. Um, you know, climate and water are inextricably linked. There's actually a great series on Netflix called Our Planet, which is basically a climate series. And they, they just this week I saw with our 17 year old um, uh, talking about climate change and the melting of the ice caps and what's that is doing. Um, and so I think as a, one of the things that's been so compelling to me is that over the last, I'd say two or three years, the stakes of um, climate change and its impact on water and water scarcity and the melting uh, the Arctic have become much clearer. And so it's created a much more compelling case for folks like me and my job to be more aggressive in terms of water. Mostly what we've done is we've uh, tried to reduce the amount of water we take out of the ground to cool our formulas. We don't have a ton of water in our products, uh, some companies do. Um, but I think it's an area, actually the term now in Europe is water pollution. They talk about discharge water. So it's an area also um, that our investors care a great deal about. Um, so it's, it's a fast moving area. I would encourage you if you're in the ESG field to really understand the technicalities around climate and water because they're definitely areas that are accelerating. So uh, talking about investors, um, you know, you said you spend I think a third of your time with investors. Um, they, they have sort of popped up and discovered this in the last five years. Uh, they're probably not as sophisticated in many respects as they need to be. Uh, are you having to educate them as well, or uh, are they really on top of what ESG means and they're applying ESG criteria intelligently in their uh, investment management portfolio decisions? 
Well, I think the good news is that the notion that you either have good values or good returns has been dispelled. There's been, I would say, over the last maybe six months, there's been some pushback on that. But I think it's pretty clear that you can be true to your values and also invest in companies that are, that have your values. Um, generally, I would say that investors have been a little bit of the head of the pack. They've been very focused on as more and more money has entered the hands of women and young people, they've made it very clear. You know, it used to be that people would say, I don't want to invest invest in X, Y, Z. And now what we're seeing is people are saying, I don't want to invest in any company that doesn't have my values. And so I think that's been very encouraging. Um, I would say when I started working with investors five years ago, sometimes there'd be one person that was on, you know, there's basically the, the buy sell side of the house and then there's right. the governance side. And it was like one person over on governance. And now we have calls um, and I'd say many investors have 10 people who, uh, you know, doing this work. So there's definitely careers now in ESG investing. I think the question I would ask, you know, if I were a student is, what am I actually going to do all day? Um, am I going to have a meaningful impact on the portfolio? The other thing that we're seeing is that our investors now have portfolio carbon goals. And so it's not just that they're ju judging our performance, but their performance as a portfolio is judged by the total carbon footprint, for instance, of the companies they invest in. So I think it's a very interesting and fast moving space. Um, the European and English investors, and actually the Canadian investors, I would say, are far more stringent often in their ESG standards, but that's not always the case. The other is, um, you know, for even what's called passive funds, the State Street, Vanguard, they have very stringent ESG screens um, that are in place. And so again, I always welcome those calls because I learn a great deal from them. And it's there is a increasing divergence or convergence, I would say, of finance in ESG. And um, you know, there's been a big movement of financial grade data in ESG. But having finance understand your program is a great advantage. Um, I, I was going to ask: Are the uh, screens that you refer to are they converging, or do, do you find a lot of variance between one investor? and another in terms of the screens they're applying? Or is there a building a consensus as to what the uh, screening criteria should be and how much weight to put on each, et cetera? Well, there's always a little bit of a black box, as in most investing. Um, in, in, I would say five years ago, they pretty standardly used a few of the um, ESG raters and rankings like MSCI or SASB, and then sort of added a little bit of their own special sauce. What we're seeing now much more is that they have their own proprietary standards. And uh, typically we'll say, you know, would you mind sharing those standards with us? That would be really helpful. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But the big push towards regulation is really because investors want standardization across expression of performance, um, you know, it, 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 we're, we're not yet at a point where carbon is like um, net operating profit or cost of goods or where it's a commonly understood metric. And it's it's sort of comparable across um, categories. So, so that's where the field is moving. I think what's a little complicated as a practitioner is Europe and the UK now have their own standards. Even within Europe, Germany and France are kind of ahead of the rest of the EU. And here in the US, we've had a standard that's been proposed but is sort of pending. Um, can you just uh, elaborate on uh, these standards and wh where is the where are the differences between Germany and France and how is Europe ahead of the U.S. in what specifics? Well, the specifics is um, basically the depth and uh, I'd say quality of the data that's being uh, asked for and the verification. There's basically something, you know, you have self-report data and then there's something called assurance. And what we currently have and what we've been doing is what's called limited assurance. And we're moving towards like um, complete assurance, similar to financial metrics. And that field is really, you know, in process. So one of the things that the regulations require differently is the level of insurance assurance. Um, also, I'd say the level of specificity on various metrics. Um, so, for instance, one metric that's being asked commonly in Europe is total plastic usage across your value chain. That's a number as a U.S. company that we don't keep. Um, and of course, the devil is in how do you define plastics? You know, whether it be a, a displayer in Sephora, we call them a gondola, or in your um, the package that you receive at home through online. So that's where 
the differing standards, all think, although I think they're moving in the same direction, the pace and specificity is a bit different. Um, do, do, do you see any move in any jurisdictions towards uh, uh, banning or restricting the sale of uh, product uh, from companies that do not meet a minimum threshold of ESG uh, performance? Um, in different categories, there is in the UK uh, a banning of products and also actually now in the US uh, that fall within their definition of being produced with forced labor. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's an area that's, that's really um, moving. I mean, I would say that generally consumer choice and consumer education, as well as really good journalism, have been uh, a very good, I'd say, force for good. I mean, sometimes they don't get it right in which we respond, but I think it's, my sense would be that the the sort of um, domain of public information is probably ultimately going to be a bit more rigorous than regulation, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, so you mentioned a few minutes ago um, that in the last six months, um, this uh, equation between purpose and uh, profit had been called into question. And I think, you know, just to uh, um, editorialize for a moment, I think the main point is that uh, profitable companies have money that they can put into ESG initiatives as opposed to ESG initiatives invested in result in additional profits. And that's where the pushback has occurred in the academic literature in particular. Um, uh, you you uh, obviously come down on uh, an empirical observation basis as saying, you know, purpose does drive profits. Can you say a little bit more about it and... Uh, have you heard in any boardroom context uh, at Estee Lauder or elsewhere that uh, um, directors are expressing concern in, in any way about uh, ESG absorbing too much time and attention? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work for a value-based company. I think one of the um, one of the trends that we've seen is that uh, although we're a public company, we are primarily family-owned. And so you will see whether it be Dell or Mars or a lot of the, the great family companies tend to have a sort of a bigger through line, I'd say, uh, of values in large part because their name is on the door. And also, you know, they're not, they have less of a, there's a term called short termism, which is sort of like the pressure to make next week, next quarter's profit. So I think a bit less of that. Um, I have not seen, you know, I think at the end of the day, though, ESG programs, just like any other expense, have to pay for themselves. Right. Um, so we are really focusing on how do we drive value in the brands? How does purpose, how does recyclability show up at retail? Uh, we've actually just created a retail sustainability program where we have sort of sustainable retail certification. Uh, we've seen a lot that, um, you know, means a great deal to our, our consumers. The other thing, though, is, you know, and I'm sure hopefully you folks feel this, there is definitely a war for great talent. And what we've seen is that our employees are our best ambassadors and advocates around this work. I was speaking earlier with, with Blanca on your team around um, sustainable buildings. Sustainable buildings is the leading issue of concern in addition to id and &E for our employees. We have green champions. We have lots of focus on how do we as a company become more sustainable. So I think what's different now about ESG is the value is showing up not just in products, but it's also showing up with employees. It's also showing up with investors. It's showing up with NGOs. I mean, you've seen some of the, you know, really strong voices that NGOs have had on this. Um, and it's it's also showing up in the communities where we live, work, and source. Um, so it's kind of a, I would say that value is a little bit more of a democratic notion than it used to be. Um, and that you've got to get all the pieces right. Okay. So I think your point about family businesses having a long-term view and, uh, you know, a, um, a commitment that comes from the, uh, the family heritage, you know, that it's a huge, be huge benefit. I oh, think. it is. And yeah. I'm lucky enough. I report to William Lauder, who's our chairman, chairman of the board, mm -hmm. um, and also Fabrizio Freda, who's our CEO. And so we do have that. Um, we also on our board of directors, there is a public nominating an ESG committee. It used right. to be nominating a governance that we report into. So this is an area actually that the board cares gr a great deal about. And really, in our reporting to the board, um, you know, makes us better. I also sit on a board, a TPG Capital a ESG board that they have. And um, I have to say that particularly private equity portfolio companies are really focusing on purpose and social impact. And 
basically Goody as she practices as brand attributes. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all these teams, there usually is one or two people who specialize in ESG. My, right. my career advice would be if you can specialize in ESG, but also, as I said, have a minor, that would be very helpful, whether it be finance or supply chain uh, and, and how this work shows up in different streams. So in, the, in that uh, vein, um, do the line business managers um, contribute to your evaluation and the evaluation of your 65 people? Um, who, who, who's assessing in the corporation? Who's assessing how the ESG team performs? That's a great question. We have a um, employee survey called the ELC Listens that they do once a year. It's totally anonymous. And in that, they do assess what are the most issues that are most important to you. Um, how do you think we're doing on those issues? And beyond that, how do you think we're communicating on those issues? So one of the things we, we realized is they care a lot about climate. We're communicating and they care about social impact, but they feel like we're under communicating on climate. So, you know, whether it be webinars or how, how I think, how do we bring employees into the work that we do? Um, and then in terms of the line workers, you know, we are a manufacturing company. Th those surveys happen in those, um, in, the, in those workplaces as well. And that comes back to us. Um, and ultimately, you know, there is this sort of multi-pronged impact of whether it be ESG ratings and rank here, it's what we're hearing from investors, what we're hearing from consumers. We have a shareholder meeting like this where, you know, Jane Q shareholder from Oshkosh, whatever, gets up and asks us questions. Um, and so th the good thing about being a public company is that there is this sort of public engagement, I would say. Um, so across stakeholders, we're evaluated, and by NGOs, fairly. Okay, so I'm going to open it up in a couple of minutes, uh, but uh, you had mentioned you attended COP27, uh, so can you give us a readout uh, from COP27, what was good, what was not so good, what was disappointing, uh, what was uplifting, uh, if anything? Well, um, I think there's there huge, there, there are different streams of, of things that happen at COP. COP is the big uh, climate meeting, essentially, that, that happens. And it's primarily a government meeting. Uh, alongside the government meeting, there are basically satellite, uh, Wall Street Journal runs a meeting, um, um, FT runs a meeting, as does Bloomberg, and also um, the New York Times. And then we worked with a group called uh, Freud's House, and essentially what, what was helpful for us was we were able to have off the record meetings and discussions with people in other consumer products companies and in tech, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Heineken, Mars, and really talking in particular around scope three. So scope three emissions are basically your suppliers and it's a big bear. And for our company, it's 95% of our footprint. So I think from a practice perspective, it was very inspiring. Um, and it was very helpful. And it gave our team, we had a small team of three people going or four people, it gave us the ability to really hear the latest and greatest from investors, also from news outlets, from government officials. So I found it very inspiring. Um, and th the meeting actually next year is in Dubai. Uh, and the focus will be on, on business. I think, you know, the bottom line, you know, having worked also in the NGO and, and foundation sector is, there is not enough smarts or money on the table for governments and private foundations to solve all this. And so the whole question is, how do businesses make a big difference in this area while also keeping the door open and running a successful business? So I think in that way, um, COP has been successful. Um, it's, it's very resource intensive, honestly, and it's one of the things we ask ourselves is who should be showing up and who should be listening. But on a practice level, I think it's, yeah. it's very helpful. What, what, can you just share, if, the, if you can recall, uh, one, one learning that uh, you gleaned from COP27 that uh, was really surprising or, or path-breaking or especially interesting? Yeah, well, I think that one of the big advancements, you know, there's this concept of loss and damage, which is how do developed countries uh, basically um, help developing nations who bear the brunt of climate change uh, address their systems and create green energy solutions. And between Scotland and uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, loss and damage actually became a fund. Like it actually went from a concept to an actual fund. And so I think that's an example of where we are seeing a, a great deal of acceleration. Also, 
carbon, carbon markets. I think the whole notion of what are the financial engines of climate um, we had a carbon market announced by Rockefeller and the State Department. There were TPG just announced another carbon market. So it's it's basically, a, I would say, a, a real advancement both in terms of the NGO government solutions, but also the private sector solutions and its impact. You know, there's been discussions about carbon, carbon tax. Um, but I, I think it's it's very, there are a lot of concepts in play and showing up really makes a difference. Great. Uh, let's uh, let's open it up. I'm sure there are a few uh, questions in the audience. Uh, let's uh, start off. Dave, thank you. Um, can someone get Dave a mic? Thanks, Caitlin. Yes, uh, uh, really enjoyed your comments. Um, you talked about suppliers in um, Shea and palm oil and so on. How much of what you do is working with suppliers to change existing practices and how much of it is we're just going to find the suppliers that have these practices? That's a great question. Um, our, our overall approach is we want to raise the bar. So we do audits um, and our, uh, you know, we do a series of audits every year and our overall approach is to raise the bar with those suppliers. Um, you know, the bottom line is um, the vast majority, there, there are very few bad actors out there, honestly. I think there's businesses that have done things in certain ways for certain periods of time. And in particular, the uh, palm around the traceability, one of the things that's been very helpful is blockchain has given us a technology so that we can actually go from plantation to mill to product. And previously, that was very, very hard to do. One of the things we've done with in our supply chain is work with other companies through a group called Action for Sustainable Derivatives, because often, so for instance, for Palm, we're not a majority user of Palm. It's mostly the food industry. Um, you know, the other is we don't want to get rid of ingredients because that kills the, the underlying business. And so how do we make that supply chain better? Um, and how do we work with suppliers as partners? So, thanks. A great question. And congratulations to you. You know, you guys have a, a program you should really be proud of. Um, really, really strong program, and really the strength of the program, I'm sure, will always be in its graduates. So, so get out there and make a difference. Thank you, uh, Daniel. <clears throat> Hello. Okay. There you go. I was going to mind. <clears throat> Thanks again, Nancy, for coming tonight, and of course, Dean Quelch for having you. Um, my questions around how you communicate your CSR strategy and your successes, right? Your performance, especially now that we have a lot of confusion in, in the media around what ESG is and woke capitalism and, and all of this kind of thing. So how do you break through that noise and what are your communication channels that you use to reach stakeholders in, in particular? It's a great question. So we have a communication strategy by stakeholder. I was just mentioning before about employees um, we have a very specific, you know, internal communication team that does all internal communications. And so ESG is layered in there, but, um, that, uh, is we've used webinars, we've used company intranet. Um, the other is how do we communicate to potential talent or talent that we want? And that's something that we're still working on. Otherwise, there is now an ESG communications team. We did not originally have one, but it's become very clear that it's so technical and so specific that you need people who understand the technical information. Um, also, we have within each brand communication leads and within each function. So for instance, supply chain communications lead does a lot of ESG communications. So we just opened a new plant in Locken in Switzerland one of the big rafts or the big um, lanes of communication was around the lead and well certification of the building. So it's really what I think is always a juggling act is how do you have an intentional ESG communication strategy that shows up in every aspect of the business? Because if it's isolated and separate, it's not really integrated in a way that, it, that needs to be meaningful. I think the good news is we've gone from, it's sort of like, you know, the nice people that sit next to HR to actual real business people. Not, not that I have anything against sitting next to HR, but. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, who's next? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dean Quelch. Thank you very much for being here. Sure, thanks uh, for smiling out there. I felt like I was doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Definitely. Um, my name's Josh, I'm a Master of Science and Sustainable Business student. Great. And, um, 
<laughs> you mentioned that um, green building was a, a key initiative amongst employees. And I was wondering if you could um, explain a little bit more on how that applies to Estee Lauder directly. If, is it um, through manufacturing or through through you know, headquarters and offices? Um, I'm just curious on... on uh, it's great. We uh, brought in actually somebody from the real estate industry who was an expert in green buildings. And we created green building standards across our offices. And that's everything from using bamboo forks to not printing... Uh, the lighting standards, um, the computer standards, you know, very sort of, I think a fair amount of practices that employees can have an impact on. Uh, and also around um, basically air exchanges, a lot of the safety issues. So we've worked in, in concert with EHS, but there is basically a subsection of our team that does green buildings and they do it for manufacturing facilities as well as we just launched a new um, innovation center in Shanghai. And I was mentioning that it's platinum certified and it was because our Chinese team said we wanna be platinum certified. And so they were part of the construction process. Uh, we also have a green retail program. Le Labo is one of our most successful fragrance divisions. Um, Le Labo just had a, built a new building. And again, our team sat in from the very, from the construction phase. The trick is on cost and on basically expression, you want to be part of the original design phase. Otherwise, the, the environmental aspects kind of stick out, I would say, as kind of bolted on. But there's a, there's a big field and the, the big real estate houses are now understanding this as well. Um, so there is there is a sort of a subspecialty in green buildings. Can't help but uh, remind you all that uh, we were just platinum certified for uh, operations and maintenance here at Miami Herbert. Thanks to Blanca. Take a bow. Um, yeah, you gotta you gotta live your values, right? Change starts at home. That's well, great. actually, that that is correct because when we launched uh, with Dave the MS in Sustainable Business Program, the uh, the second thought I had was, gosh, you know, we better make sure our own uh, buildings are uh, green, or else we're going to be really uh, subject to a, a lot of potential criticism. But that's so, a great example. I was lucky enough to spend time with Blanca before this. Is how first of all she's done such a great job, but obviously it started with you with leadership, but also how much more meaningful her job is for her, right? right? You know, you know, she's not an ESG specialist, but you've integrated into her work, which is, which is more meaningful. And, and, yeah. you know, it, it, you know, just listening to Blanca and listening to, I mean, the amount of pride you have in, you know, living, living your buildings through your, you know, your values there. So it's, it's, that, that's how it works basically. Mm -hmm. Leadership matters. Thank you. Um, so I think we had, uh, yeah, we got two more up uh, front. Uh, so we'll take the lady first and then uh, uh, come to uh, the front row. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for being here today. Sure. My question was, what is the most difficult material topic that you've had to tackle um, in your experience in sustainability? What's the most difficult material? Material topic. So for your stakeholders, what has been the most material topic that's been difficult to tackle? I'd say plastic. Have you guys ever seen the movie, The Graduate? Yeah. You know, he's walking around the pool and this old guy, you know the line from this movie? Um, D Dustin Hoffman's walking around with this, you know, what seems to be like an antiquated guy. And he goes, I have one, I have one word for you. I have one word for the future of business. The future is plastics. <laughs> and so now we're at a point where, you know, plastics from a container perspective um, is actually a great material. It, keep, uh, it keeps them safe. Um, it's pretty light, um, but what we've really found in the world is that plastic is really bad for our environment, and so we're all trying to lean in to find plastic alternatives um, and to really reduce the amount of what's called virgin plastic in all of our packaging, uh, but that has not been easy, uh, and it's something we need to continue to work on, but I'd say that plastics is, is really one of the, the great uh, challenges in terms of reducing its environmental impact, and you've seen some great work by other CPG companies you know, taking shoes and making playgrounds. Um, I think also one of the big conceptual innovation challenges is how do we, how does ESG just like and circularity totally reinvent your business model and see some of the great work that we've seen of some of the apparel companies like Patagonia, where you can bring in an old coat. Um, you know, like that's what to me is the most interesting and challenging, which is what is the white space? How will ESG basically blow up your industry? And that's going to happen in every single industry. Look at electric vehicles. You know, you've got to a point now where GM is saying to franchise owners, if you're not going to sell electric vehicles, 
we're going to buy your dealerships. Like we're not interested in working with you. So I think that's, that to me is the most interesting and complex challenge of ours is within every industry, how does it need to be reinvented? Let's go to the front row, uh, front row first, and that, then we'll come to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for joining us this evening. Sure. It's great having you. Uh, my name is Robert. I am a full-time MBA student here. Um, my question you actually just touched on a little bit. I was curious about the intersection between innovation and ESG. I mean, the beauty products, cosmetic industry is very competitive, so I'm sure the company's always looking for some kind of competitive advantage. Um, so I was wondering how much that kind of goes into the calculus of what you're doing, um, in addition to it being the right thing to do and kind of optimizing existing products and supply chains, et cetera, to make them more sustainable? It's a great question. So our team's job is to create, uh, with other subject matter experts like packaging, the best practices possible in sustainable design and practice, and then to deploy them to the brands. What we've seen overall is that sustainable beauty um, uh, and, and nature-oriented beauty has a CAGR of about 9.5% growth. And so we're seeing incredible growth. And actually, one of our competitors, a Brazilian portfolio company, Natura, has done extraordinarily well, um, I think in large part with the Brazilian heritage, um, in creating sustainable brands. And that's a, a company we like to watch and, and doing a very good job. So overall, what we're hearing from investors and what we're seeing is not just how much money are you investing in sustainable innovation, but what's the impact? And so we work very heavily with our um, consumer marketing departments around claims, um, back to the new product launch. So at the very beginning stage of a life cycle of a product, if a brand wants to make a sustainable claim, we work with legal, we work with our R&D teams, what needs to be true for them to make that claim? Is it possible for them to make that claim? And then all the way at the end of the product, the question becomes, how does that claim perform against a benefits claim? Which is basically your skin is softer versus this has a net zero imprint. And so what we're seeing is that it has to be one of the attributes that brand presidents, marketers are given and consumers are offered to make the choice. Because it really comes down to consumer price, and I'm sorry, consumer choice, and to some extent around price. Because, you know, we're definitely in an environment with inflation. You know, as a U.S.-based business, our currency has been doing very well, right? And that gives headwinds for U.S.-based business because that means that we have to price in for our strong currency. Um, but what I'm enthused about is that we see more and more consumer demand for transparency, for um, sustainable products, and for efficiency. And I think for a long time there was a feeling, well, you know, if that product is not, doesn't have really beautiful packaging, even though it's not sustainable, consumers won't buy it, will buy it. And what we're seeing is they want, they want sustainable attributes plus a great looking product and a, a product that works. And we can do all three of those, but it's more difficult. Also, you know, congratulations to you for getting an MBA. I always, you know, I have a law degree and every once in a while, including earlier today, I thought maybe I should get an MBA. <laughs> and people are like, no, no, but I love school. But I think an MBA is great training for, again, understanding how businesses run, the core business practices, and being able to do, run a great business and offer sustainable products and sustainable practices. So. It's all about efficiency at this point. So anyway, keep going. All right. Next one. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for being here. The sure. conversation has been really insightful. Uh, my name is Achin. I'm an undergraduate studying finance. I have a question of, well, it's actually a two-part question about your Estee Lauder's recent, uh, recent acquisition of uh, Tom Ford. Uh, so essentially... There's two parts of the business. There's the cosmetics part, and then there's the ready-to-wear part. Uh, so the cosmetics part is being reabsorbed into the main supply chain since they were already producing it under a beauty license. What does that mean for sustainability efforts at the main company? And the second part being the ready-to-wear being licensed out to Zegna Group. How do you make, um, maintain kind of, a, what's the word, accountability within their supply chain, seeing as they're a major partner? That is a terrific question, uh, one that we're <laughs> to give you a, applause for that one. So we did just acquire Tom, you know, Tom Ford is, is, is a person, uh, and we have for a very long time had the, the beauty license and the fragrance license. He decided, I guess, last year that he just wanted to sell the whole business. 
um, and we were successful in acquiring the business. So it's our largest acquisition to date. It is the first time that we, we've always been what we call a pure play beauty player, which is that we've not been in fashion. So the way that the deal is structured is that Xenia will be, will continue to be the uh, fashion um, licensee as it was before. And Markelin will continue to be the eyewear um, uh, uh, licensee. So as a licensor, you are correct in that we do own the environmental footprint to a great extent of those businesses. And in fact, it's one of the great opportunities that we see is how do we learn from the fashion business? You may also know that he has had a very successful plastics prize, um, Tom Ford Plastics Prize, and he sells a watch, which is one of the only watches in the world that's entirely um, made of actually recycled plastic. So that's another piece of the business. So we're very excited. Generally, our uh, European competitors who do have fashion within their houses, LVMH carrying, have a higher ESG bar, and they are able to use the fashion division and the beauty division, I'd say, to kind of cross-pollinate. But it is a, a nice new challenge. Um, and there is, for carbon, there's uh, in, in Rule 14 of the science-based targets, there's a provision for franchisees and franchisors. And so we believe under that Rule 14 that their, um, their carbon footprint will be part of our scope three. So we're in the midst of, of doing that work. But that's an example of very deep end, um, important deal that's happening in our company that very much has ESG implications. So thanks for that really great question. Really was a great question, and I think it underscores the value of when you come to these events, you know, do some research before you come, and, um, you know, the more you know about the company, the more you're going to impress the potential employer. Um, so do we do we have any more questions uh, at all? We're at 7 o'clock. I don't know, two bites of the same apple. I think I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have complimented you so much. Uh, now you yeah. want more. Now comes the real one, right? <laughs> yeah. Let, let's see if there's one more question. We're past the seven o'clock hour and uh, we always try and keep on time. So yeah, let's take one last question and then there'll be uh, time to uh, have a chat with Nancy. We're a small group, so it shouldn't be too difficult to have a few words in a moment after we finish. Go ahead. Nancy, thank you for being here. Um, you know, there's this widespread effort in the industry right now to be more sustainable. You think about reducing synthetic ingredients and product. You think about reducing water composition and packaging, or uh, even using renewable energy uh, when it comes to the manufacturing process. You mentioned in an interview last year uh, during Climate Week, uh, when it comes to a collaborative effort across the industry, that when one beauty brand wins, everyone wins. How, when it comes from the standpoint of the, the promotion of purpose, how do you measure a win? Is it a matter of driving bottom line? Is it a matter of being held to a standard like Europe when it comes to plastic, uh, the measurement of plastic and product? Or is it um, just seeing the impact firsthand uh, that the sustainable effort causes in the world, the, the good that it's doing? Or is it a healthy combination of all three? Wow, I'd say probably D, all of the above. Um, you know, generally what we try and do is take a look at the overall momentum that we're having in different lanes. Um, and one of the things that's, I think, so exciting about this field is that the pace of different areas keeps changing. So climate continues to accelerate, water's accelerated. Um, and um, we, we use, we basically, our, you know, um, our, our CEO, Fabrizio Freda, is very focused on strategy and corporate strategy, and we do it stakeholder by stakeholder, and every year we're held accountable, and we bring back where we're doing well, where we think we could be doing better, um, and so I think it's very important to stay humble, um, stay focused on, you know, the ultimate, because sometimes you can be a hero or a bum, and it's not necessarily, you know, fair, um, Although, although ESG is not dodgeball, some days it feels like it is dodgeball. But I think, you, you know, you have to basically pick your metrics, manage your metrics, and then, you know, stay humble. I spent a lot of time talking to our team, saying, how could we be doing better? Another important piece of success is how well are we integrating into other departments? Do they feel like we're real partners? Do they feel joy and pride in the work that we're doing? Um, how do we solve for the frustrations or overload that they may have? So a lot of the the, um, the work is also, I would say, change management and, and business integration. So um, 
But I do, you know, before we wrap, I do really want to thank the Dean uh, for this incredible invitation and really congratulate you on building really an outstanding program. There's so much to be proud of. Um, and it's no uh, overstatement to say that you guys really are the future of the field. I couldn't be more excited about the opportunities within ESG for talent. And whether you're a straight up finance person and you're just part of the ESG team um, or whether you specialize in it, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, so I would really encourage you to keep educating yourself, particularly I would say the FT, um, but really keep reading about ESG, stay involved. Um, and if you go into a job that's not an ESG job, raise your hand and offer to help. All these departments like our departments need help and we need, tr we need, help integrating into those business. So good luck with your exams and thanks for coming. All right, so thank you very much, Nancy. That's terrific. Uh, just one, one last question. If, uh, if uh, some of our students here are inspired, as I'm sure they are, by your uh, excellent comments uh, and uh, after proper research, uh, take a interest in uh, um, potentially um, talking to Estee Lauder, how, how, how should they be in touch? Actually, uh, we do have our internship program. It is actually, summer internship program, I think, is closed for this coming summer, but it's basically rising juniors. Um, you can apply the next year. We also have a program, a presidential program, where you're postgraduate, you rotate through different departments. Um, and uh, el.coms, if there's a job there, go ahead and apply, and you can definitely find me on LinkedIn. Um, if you, you know, or talk with me here today, I think we may have one or two openings now if folks are looking for jobs, but basically I would say, keep looking. It's much easier to get your foot in the door if there is an open position. Yeah. Super. Well, thanks again. It's been fantastic and, uh, really appreciate you rounding out our season of uh, speakers this evening Thank and, you. uh, a have a good holiday venue. as well. Yes. Yeah. Happy holidays. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you. And now we have some uh, food and beverages, so please feel free. Thank you.